what is up youtube welcome back to my channel if this is your first time here then it's just welcome to my channel it's not welcome back it's just welcome go ahead and hit the subs okay here relax go ahead and hit the subscribe button because you will not be disappointed today's video is going to be another true crime and makeup story y'all i was feeling selena vibes today like i really i was trying to get this little wig up in a ponytail girl and just give you the full experience but it didn't work out like that whatever judge me not today's story is about marcus wesson see as a child little old marcus's favorite game to play was a preacher leading his flock he was god and he was the center of attention that childhood game never stopped for marcus it actually just grew more bizarre so if you're interested in hearing that story and seeing how to achieve this look just keep on watching. <laughs> Did y'all like that little dramatic intro where I was like, as a child, what I say? As a child, Marcus. Did y'all like that? Was that cute? <laughs> if it was, I can do like little previews like that in the beginning of the video. I think that's a cute little touch. Let me know. But anyway, I'm rambling. Let's just get into the video. We got a lot to talk about today. They're doing landscaping in my neighborhood, so I hope y'all don't hear too much of the grass cutting because they didn't move on from in front of my building, so... I don't think it'll be too loud. Hopefully not. Y'all, I have been on a mission to better my skin. And when I say, I think we're making progress. Because aside from my freckles, she looks pretty clear. Today's video is a lot. I don't know if we're going to be able to cover everything in one video or one look. I'm not sure yet. We're going to find out together. Marcus was born in Kansas on August 22nd, 1946. And if I'm not mistaken, that's what... The last day of Leo season. So, you know, I'll leave that for the Leos and the Virgos to fight about in the comments, child. Because, you know, y'all likes to try to leave them off if it's like the last day. Like, they don't count. Technically, it's a Virgo. He was the oldest of four children between a lady by the name of Karen Wesson and her husband, Benjamin Wesson. Now, Benjamin, he was an alcoholic child abuser. And Miss Carrie, she was described as a religious fanatic now it was widely speculated that benjamin sexually abused the children on down the line marcus's sister didn't outright come out and say that per se but she did say that when he was drinking he was much more inclined to kiss and hug them and that the children learned early on that the best way to avoid like unwanted physical attention from their father was to hide out when he got drunk they would just hide until he sobered up. Now, a childhood friend of the Weston children claimed that Benjamin had offered him $50 for oral sex. And so, yeah, he was, he was probably touching on his own children. He was touching them damn children. Now, sometime after this came out, Benjamin, nasty Benjamin, he took off with a male cousin of his with whom he was having a sexual affair. This affair goes on for an entire 10 years before Benjamin decides, you know what, I want my family back. And he returns to Carrie and the children as if nothing had ever happened, ready to reassume his parental duties as if nothing had happened. Like, sir, you've been, ran you've been off in a whole incestuous relationship with our cousin. It's upsetting me in my home, girl. Can we talk about this? Oh, we're not going to talk about it? Noted. Only in Carrie's house, honey. Only in Carrie's house could this have happened. Because it couldn't happen to mine. When Benjamin returned, the couple, they pack up their four children and they move to San Bernardino, California. Now, in school, Marcus, he was a very unimpressive student. He didn't do much of his schoolwork. He was very quiet, very to himself. The type of student who kind of didn't care about being cool. He wasn't trying to smoke, drink wear what the cool kids wore actually when they were wearing t-shirts and jeans marcus wore selects and a button down and a tie every day to school now marcus was a pretty big boy but despite his size he was more inclined to being bullied versus bullying anybody else just because of his physical appearance his lack of social skills like he was just different now this is something that i thought was particularly interesting because marcus did not earn enough credits to graduate but they still let him walk anyway like I, I don't know if they were just ready to get him up out of there or what it was but they allowed him to participate in his classes graduation and uh when everybody else walked across the stage and got a diploma that girl just got a rolled up piece of paper with a smiley face sticker he never received a diploma you know it's bad they just did not want to see him again another year they just did not i 
after high school, he joined the army and he was stationed over in Europe until 1968. So after getting the boot for the military, he returns to the States where he meets and becomes involved with a lady by the name of Rosemary Solorio. I believe that's how you say her name. Now, Rosemary is a married woman that is a whole 15 years older than Marcus. At the time that they're dating, she has a husband. She already has seven children of her own by her husband and yeah it's just a lot going on not long after the two began to date rosemary decided marcus was the man for her not her husband so she ends things with her husband and she moves marcus into the home with her and her seven children i'm gonna have to enter it like a little meter on the screen for when i start to get irritated with these stories child because by the end of the story i'm always fed up i'm always just fed the fuck up i just i feel like it's it's starting now so anywho, she moves him in with her seven children. And in the beginning, everything was seemingly okay. Really up until this point, Marcus had led a pretty uneventful life. Like, yeah, he was a little weird, but nothing much had really happened. Like nothing too crazy had really happened. So you know we about do for some mess, right? Marcus becomes a little bit obsessed with religion, right? He is overly obsessing over religion. Not just any old religion. It was one of his own making, which us normal folks would consider more of a cult he, he was making a cult child he was coming up with a, it was a cult okay now in this religion marcus stated that jesus christ was a vampire and um he would often refer to himself as jesus christ and sometimes he was god he would just he would just switch it up he declared himself a vampire god when he first began trying to get this little religion off the ground like it's a like it's a mixtape, honey. He started out twisting the words and scriptures of the regular Bible to reflect his teachings. And then after a while, he decided, you know what? I need my own Bible. I need my own good book. And so he started to write his own. Marcus believed and he taught his family that they were like vampires, but different because they had souls. Whereas regular vampires, they were prohibited from moving around in the daylight because they didn't have souls. And that's why him and his family could do it because they did have souls. Or maybe because y'all wasn't fucking vampires, sir. But <laughs> child, let me just not, let me just tell the story. This did not scare Rosemary away because girl, I would have been like, you a what now? We what? Boy, if you don't get- Nah. Nope. But Rosemary, she loved him. So they kept going at it and in 1971, she gave birth to Marcus's first child, which was a son. Now, at that same time, Marcus was already cultivating a relationship with one of Rosemary's daughters, Elizabeth. Yes, one of her children. He had told Elizabeth and Rosemary that God had chosen Elizabeth to be one of his brides. Mind you, at this particular point in time, Elizabeth is only five five years old at the age of eight years old elizabeth is then married to marcus in a home ceremony marcus is 27 at the time 27 home marrying an eight-year-old <sighs> at age 12 four years after that is when he is said to have started sexually abusing her i don't really believe that he wasn't sexually abusing her before beforehand i just don't believe it but that's what they say i'm not buying it though i just ain't i just don't believe it when elizabeth was 15 years old she then legally married weston because she was at that point pregnant by him four months after elizabeth marries marcus she gives birth to her first child and this actually would be the first of 10 children that the two would have together weston he takes elizabeth he moves out of the house with rosemary and he decides that he is going to start a family. Marcus's vision was to have this great big family. And of course, because Rosemary was a little older, she wasn't gonna be able to give him all these kids that Elizabeth could give him. So he saw her as his opportunity to just like start this, this family that he envisioned for himself. He moved her out of her mother's home and the two, they start their little life together. Now fast forward on down the line, they are living together, they're having children together. Elizabeth's younger sister, she's, of course, she's an adult now on her own. Fortunately, she developed a drug addiction and she had had seven children of her own, which they have been 
bounced around a lot and had unfortunately suffered a lot of abuse from people who you know dealt with their mother I guess who she was dating who she was getting drugs from like random people had you know done things to them she got to the point where she recognized that she was not able to care for her children and so she asked her sister Elizabeth to take them in now from the outside looking in Elizabeth she had a normal little housewife life she was just over there you know cooking for her man taking care of the kids and her man was holding down the household so when elizabeth's sister got to the point where she felt like she couldn't take care of the kids anymore and the wessons offered to take the children in for her she saw this as a great opportunity and the kids were excited too they were eager to move into the Weston home believing that they would be safe and that they would have a better life and child unfortunately that's not what happened Sophina, she's an 11 year old she is one of the sister's daughters she recalled that as soon as they moved in marcus told them that they would no longer be attending public school because he planned on homeschooling all the children and child he was not teaching them the regular core curriculum he was teaching them about his own beliefs about vampire godism and how he was Jesus and sometimes he was God. And it's just like Miss Day, where is the algebra? How many states is there? Marcus was also very abusive to Elizabeth and the children. Elizabeth had very little say about what goes on in the house. Everything was pretty much what Marcus Wesson said, quit. Marcus made the rules and what he said was law. He was the only one that was allowed to homeschool the children or school them on anything. He only taught them from his own handwritten Bible, you know, the one where Jesus is a vampire, that one. He demanded that the entire household refer to him as master or Lord at all times. He taught the children that they all needed to prepare for Armageddon and that the daughters were destined to be his future wives. He separated the boys from the girls fearing that they would develop an attraction for each other. A lot of times they kind of were homeless. They lived in a broken down boat. There was a time where they had a house but he would make all the boys sleep and live out of the shack in a wooded area behind the house because he just did not want the men around his future ladies which is so sick and twisted like the older girls in the family they took it upon themselves to like teach the younger so they at least know their colors and their numbers and things like that and so they would often play teacher to the younger children now much like his own father marcus he refused to work he held on to the notion that the head of the household was the man and the man slash the head of the household did not work. I don't know where he got that from because I thought the head of the household was the one that worked. Brought home the bacon. The family lived off welfare for a while and then when the children were old enough to work, he would require that they work and bring home their paycheck to him to, you know, supplement the household. He did not allow Elizabeth to work. Actually, he didn't even allow her to finish high school. So neither one of them had a house high school diploma. The family would rotate between living in old boats, run down shacks and vacant houses. Now fast forward to 1989, Marcus is convicted of welfare fraud and perjury, but he didn't, he didn't spend no time in jail for it. Now, if you're wondering how the hell all this went on so long without anybody reporting it to social services or anybody, you know, getting involved in taking the children. These were not kids that were in public school. These are not kids that went to regular doctor's visits where somebody could see something wrong and, you know, report it. They were intentionally kept from the outside world by their father because he knew that the world was not going to accept his bizarre, crazy beliefs and teachings. He knew we were all going to be like, wait. He would also like paint the picture of the outside world to just be so bad. He would show them images on TV of violence and he would tell them like, this is what they do to God's vampire people. They don't, you know, they don't respect us. They don't understand they're against us. Stay away from the people out there. Like that's, that's kind of the whole energy that he had. Cause you know, in order to control somebody, you gotta have fear. He told his family that the outside world could not be trusted. The government could not be trusted. And if in any event that they tried to come in and break up the family, they were to follow the plans of a murder suicide pact that he had formulated. I'm just gonna let you know, I know my rig is crooked. I know the middle part ain't lined up. 
a lady like that. I've seen it. You don't have to point it out. Back to the story. Marcus eventually married and had children with three of the nieces, Ruby, Rose, and Sophina. And these marriages were in addition to, of course, his marriage to Elizabeth and marriages to two of his own daughters. Yes, two of his own daughters. He preached that having as many children as possible was ordained by God. I hands down would have been like the most annoying kid because I would have been like, so was your birthday not the second coming of Jesus? Or are you the original Jesus? So if you're the original Jesus and we have to wait on the second coming of Jesus, don't you have to die first? Like when are you gonna die? I be, it's all kind of questions I have to ask. I just would have so many questions. He used this whole go forth and be fruitful thing to justify in a sick, twisted way, him having kids with his daughters and his nieces. Girl, I thought I was giving um Selena, but I feel like I'm giving more and more Tisha. I made the mistake of picking a very short look to go with a very long story. So for the rest of the video, I'm just gonna be telling the story. Now he's getting the older of the children pregnant and he is telling them like, don't tell anybody who the father of your child is. So they never spoke about who the father of their child is. He threatened to harm both them and the child if they did. Now between his wife Elizabeth, his nieces and his own five daughters, Marcus Wesson fathered 18 children, 18. Now, Elizabeth, she lived in her own self-imposed state of denial. Probably also a little fear, too, because her husband was, Marcus was a big guy, okay? She never tried to put a stop to anything. She catered to her husband's every whim. She waited on him hand and foot, and according to her, she was just there to keep the peace and avoid making waves. Excuse me. Now, Elizabeth, she had stopped going to school in eighth grade. So her lack of knowledge really helped Marcus to keep her like fully dependent on him, which is still no excuse for her to have stayed and dealt with this mess. But you know, I'm just here to tell you how the story went. Marcus's bald headed ass imposed a lot of rules on the family that he was not required to abide by himself under the premise that he was the vampire god man of the house if he wanted to dine out on fast food while the rest of the family scavenged dumpsters for food he did and he did this often because he was vampire god mr vampire god sir ain't you supposed to be drinking blood anyway like i just don't even ah, child if he wanted to eat cookies and all kind of delectables and have the family on a diet, which you often kept Elizabeth and the family on a sugar-free diet, primarily consisting of pinto beans and vegetables alongside stale bread. Meanwhile, he over here eating ho-hos, zuzus, and wham-whams, and he could because he was the vampire god man of the house, and his word was law. Child, your word would've had me fucked up. And he was very serious about these diets. On one occasion, his son, Serafino, he was caught sneaking a spoon of peanut butter. Now, Marcus kept a stick that he wrapped in duct tape on hand for occasions like this, just in case somebody decided that they were gonna go against his word. Now, as punishment for stealing this spoon of peanut butter, Serafino was subjected to 30 days of beatings with this stick wrapped in duct tape by his father. 30 days for peanut butter. They didn't even give your ass 30 days for that um welfare fraud and perjury, my girl. So why you, but you wanna do all of this for peanut butter. He would beat the girls also for small infractions and the girls were required to wear long sleeve shirts, long ankle length skirts at all times, full scarves on their head to keep their entire head wrapped up. And he kept them wrapped up like this and covered up like this for two reasons. One, he knew that he was physically abusive, so he couldn't run the risk of somebody seeing bruises and scratches on these girls. And two, he felt like this was modest dress for a woman. He didn't want nobody looking at any of his women. And so he wanted to keep them covered up. Now, as the children grew into teens and they got out there down to the little Chick-fil-A's and stuff, trying to get a job and take care of the household, people start to notice things about them that's kind of odd, kind of off and out of place. But unfortunately, still nobody spoke up for them or, you know, or brought any attention to this, this strange little family. They were just weird. The owner of a small convenience store that the family frequented, she later on did say that she had some kind of concerns, 
because she noticed that the young ones were coming in pregnant and the older ones who weren't that old at all, they were coming in buying diapers often. She knew at the time that they had no social life and really no contact with the outside world. And so for them to be pregnant would kind of be strange, like something had to be going on, something fishy. But unfortunately, she said nothing at the time. Like she just... She kept her suspicions to herself. So as the kids are getting older, one of Marcus's fears becomes a reality. He learns that his son, Alme, had developed a little, a little crush, a little, um, a little interest in one of Elizabeth's nieces, which technically that's not, technically, I think it still is incest though. But really they weren't blood related because well, I guess they kind of are because of Elizabeth, his mama, and that's Elizabeth's sister's child. Oh, yeah, there's still incest, my bad. Well, he learned that Alme was interested in one of the nieces, and he becomes very upset. He writes a 14-page document that ordered the sons to stay away from the women of the house. And I'm smiling because this is just so fucking ridiculous. Like, are you insane? He warned Alme that if he failed to discontinue his pursuit of the knees. The end result would be a family prayer in which vampire Jesus himself, Marcus, he would go to God himself and ask that he remove the offending entity from the family. Now Marcus summed that up with a flat out just telling him in the end after reading the 14 pages. Get a life, find your own women as God has commanded. Sir, God didn't command that, you just commanded that. You just went and wrote this in the other room. I walked past and I saw you. Furthermore, I thought you was God. Like, I'm still confused. Like, if you God, if you vampire God, who who are you going to pray to? I thought you was, I thought you was the big homie. Like, I'm confused. Child, let me just, there's so much confusion. Now, because Marcus was starting to see, like, he could potentially be threatened by these young men, he began to encourage the male children to leave the nest as soon as they are old enough to provide for themselves. He like, you know what? Going on, going on about your business, sir. I don't need you making problems for me and my harem of women. He wasn't trying to take any chances with them becoming competition for him, nor was he trying to take a chance that one of them might, you know, up and challenge his authority. Now, two of the children also left the household when they were of age, and this was against Marcus's urging. I do apologize, they couldn't grasp, but we almost done. He was not in favor of these two leaving the household. They each had a son with him, and when they left, he would not allow them to take the children with them. Now, when they left their sons in Weston's care, they claimed that he had given his word to do right by their children. And then, of course, they knew that he wasn't as abusive toward the boys as he was toward the girls. And so I guess they kind of, I guess they felt a little secure in that. They heard that Marcus was about to move the entire family to Washington State. Now, in fear of losing all contact with their two sons, Sophina and Ruby decided they're going to go to the house and demand that he release their children. The two young women, along with some of their closest friends and their family, they band together. They go up to the Weston clan house. They go to Marcus's house and they demand that he release their sons. He give them custody of their children right now. Now, Marcus, he emerges from the household. Marcus is a big old guy. He over six feet, pushing 400 pounds with these huge, thick, graying dreadlocks, child. He just beard, mustache, child, just ugly as sin. Here you go, look at him, just ugly. The women are yelling for their children. Marcus really isn't saying anything back. They're demanding custody of their kids. It's a little loud. Okay, a little rambunctious. One of the neighbors calls the police and reports a custody dispute. So the police come around there. They're like, what's up? As the police approach the scene, Marcus goes back into the house, closes the door behind him, and locks it. The police approach the door. They're telling Marcus to come outside. They're demanding that he at least unlock the door and open the door to speak to an officer. That's when they hear the first gunshot. Within minutes, a series of gunshots pierce the air. They go off right after that. Police surround the house, and Marcus, he emerges once again from the house, but this time, completely covered in blood he's very calm he comes out hands up he says nothing he's like disturbingly quiet they handcuff him he is completely cooperative he does not try to evade arrest or try to attack nobody when police enter the home there are nine bodies 
stacked in the back bedroom. Seven of the nine were under the age of 12. The other two victims were 17 year old Elizabeth, which is their daughter they named after the wife Elizabeth. It's not the wife, it's the daughter. And 25 year old Sabrina Weston. Each victim had been shot fatally through the eye. All of the other kids that were not home at the time of the incident survived it, of course. Outside, the two mothers, Sophia and Ruby, they are still yelling out for their children. Here's a photo of the two ladies from when they were both pregnant with the children that they were returning for who were fathered by Marcus. Unfortunately, their two children were among the nine victims. Now, Marcus Weston had always told his family that if anyone ever tried to separate the family, that they would all go to heaven. It was all a lie. He didn't kill his damn self and he did not kill Elizabeth either, the wife. So it's like, what you mean? Here you are, not shot. Like you didn't kill yourself, you killed everybody else. <sighs> Marcus had purchased a dozen antique caskets for the family months before the massacre. He claimed that he had no solid plans for massacring his family. And these caskets were used for beds for the children. Sure. Now, at Marcus's trial, his defense, his public defender, presented the defense that his oldest daughter, Sabrina, who was among the victims, she had actually shot everybody, including her own two-year-old son, and then herself in the end, and that he had not committed none of these murders. The weapon used was a 22 caliber pistol, which was found with Sabrina's body. It was also tested for DNA and it was only her DNA on the gun, none of Marcus's, which led credit to his claim that she was the one that fired the gun instead of him. Now the jury, they did conclude that Marcus did not fire the fatal shot, but they convicted him of murder anyway because he had persuaded his children to enter into this whole suicide pact. So it was like, yes, yeah, sir. Nice try, but no. The daughters and the nieces that survived the incident, they testified at his trial and they told about all the horrific abuse that they had suffered at the hands of Marcus. How he was so sick and so twisted and how he had assured them for so long that his sexual abuse was a way that fathers showed affection to their daughters. It's like, that's kind of, that's scary actually. That's, that's actually very frightening coming from somebody who's scared feeling like they're gonna be the most protect or protective parent on the face of the earth like I feel like I'm gonna be scared of everything but that really shook me like that really scared me to think that somebody would be so terrible like you could convince a child that this is a way that a father shows affection to his daughter and then threaten her into silence and then this could be going on like I just y'all I'm so scared to have a child because I just now, on the flip side, though, Marcus's sons took the stand and painted a completely different picture of their father. They claimed that he was, quote, the best father that anyone could ever have. His son, Serafino, the one that got popped for the peanut butter for 30 days and 30 nights, even took the stand and said that, quote, he looks really dangerous, but he's such a gentle guy. I can't believe he did this. Well, he said, I can't believe he did it, but you know. Same different. The Wesson sons claimed that because they were raised away from the sisters because of their father's fear that they would develop feelings for the girls. They say because of this, they knew very little about any kind of abuse that was going on with the daughters. They claimed to be completely oblivious to their father's interests or attraction to these girls marrying their sisters. Now, Elizabeth, Marcus's wife, she was granted an immunity deal in exchange for her testifying against her husband and her full cooperation. And when I say that was a bust because she just got up there and it said she didn't know anything. She didn't know nothing. She said she had no knowledge of the abuse that was going on. When questioned about the girls becoming pregnant very young, she said that the girls did not disclose who the father of their babies were, nor did she ask, excuse me? If I got a house full of little girls popping up pregnant left and right, oh, her testimony, y'all, is so frustrating. Like, I understand that she got with him when she was just 15. I understand how, you know, brainwashing and stuff goes, but... I also believe that, you know, maybe she was a she was a little mentally off, they said. But her testimony is still so, so frustrating. Like, I'm going to put a couple of the questions and answers in the description box if you to scroll down and read if you want to, if you're interested. The transcript is so frustrating. Like, the entire transcript you can find online is so irritating. Some of the answers she had for some of these questions, child, I'm just like, 
What? She's also done interviews that you can find online. I have not watched the interviews. I was frustrated enough with the line of questioning and the answer she gave in her testimony and the fact that she got immunity for this. I didn't even want to see the interview. I was just like, girl. And then the fact that you want to sit up here and say you had no idea this was going on. None. Are you dumb? I'm, I've added that. On June 17, 2005, Marcus Weston is convicted of nine counts of first degree murder. He was also found guilty on 14 counts of child molestation for his nieces and his daughters. He was sentenced to death. Electric chair. And he is currently still incarcerated on death row down to San Quentin State Prison. Getting ugly about the day, child. Just look at him. Just, just look, look at him. I have been going back and forth in my head about whether or not I was going to do this story because it's just so irritating to me to sit here and talk to y'all about this. <sighs> he really irritates my, the asshole of my soul. But that is it for this video and this story. Please let me know your thoughts down below. Why am I starting to laugh? That is it for this video. Let me know your thoughts down below. Don't forget to give it a thumbs up before you leave. Share the video with a friend if you enjoyed it. Subscribe if you have not. As always, I appreciate you so much for watching. And uh, I will see you in the next one.